Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Peach Pundit Podcast. Jason Pye joined by my good friends Buzz Brockway and Scott Turner. Ooh. What's up, guys? Yeah. Scott, that's a nice t-shirt you have on today. Thank you. Join or die. It, you know, it, it's a classic. It matches my tattoo. Matches my tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the main difference being it's a tattoo and you're wearing a t-shirt, but you also have the state uh, the state uh, initials there, whereas I don't have that on my arm. Yeah, well, this is a, represent, uh, a reproduction from the flag, obviously, but uh, also I'm not a tattoo guy, so I like to be able to change my mind so I get T-shirts instead of tattoos. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about this before we came on. Uh, there was I have, I have one really obscure tattoo from a book uh, that's a guy riding a manatee, and <laughs> and I got that. I got that based on uh, an agreement with with the author of a book. The guy who runs the A Crime a Day Twitter account wrote a book last year, two years ago, on how to become a federal criminal. And he, we agreed that he was in an autographed copy of his book to a friend of mine. And I'll get the tattoo. And it basically just got to the point where I stopped caring what I got put on my body. <laughs> um, that's that's. You, I care what goes into my body. I don't care what I put on it. So I like. No. I, so sponsorship opportunities are available on. <laughs> this is true. And I actually, so we went to a, a fall festival in Conyers last year. And I even got the pandemic guy tattooed on me because it was cheap. It was <laughs> and I was, I, I, I had Vernon, a Vernon Jones may call and want a, um, you know, Vernon for governor tattoo. Yeah. You know? well, the, the thing is I have to agree with it. And I do not agree. <laughs> for, I do not agree with that. Uh, so, but you somehow agree with a man writing a manatee. Y- yeah. Yeah, it's an obscure oh. federal federal crime. It's it's, it's freedom. It's right? not obscure. I'm telling you, in Florida, they teach children to not ride the manatees. This is a real thing. No, I, I so if, when I got the tattoo, uh, uh, Sarah Rumpf, who uh, is a used to well, is, is was it, a conservative blogger who uh, mm-hmm. she she's from Florida. She actually lit me up on Facebook for getting it. And I was like, look, it's just it's 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 an effing tattoo. Like, leave me alone. It's, it's, I'm not serious. It's not a federal crime. I'm like, you should get rid of that. I'm not saying that it's just, it just highlights the obscurity of federal crimes. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So a lot of political news in the last, uh, in the last week, particularly uh, in the last uh, 24 hours, which we'll get to down the road here. Uh, But yesterday uh, I did notice this when I got my weekly update and buzz. I still owe you a, a an email um, when I got my weekly update from the Senate side uh, yesterday, or I guess beginning of the week, that there was a pretty interesting hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday. Um, yes, it was Senate. Yeah. And, well, I knew it was Senate. I just couldn't remember which, which committee. Uh, Dick with, Durbin chaired it. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, this that's Senate Judiciary. Uh, in which, uh, in which they they explored uh, they explored uh, the the this, I guess the string of election quote unquote reforms that we're seeing around the country, or at least discussion of it. Uh, and, and Georgia featured prominently. The the title of the hearing I think uh, uh, bothered a lot of people. Uh, the hearing was called uh, Jim Crow 2021: The Latest Assault on the Right to Vote. Yeah. And if you look at the I mean, look, it's 420. You should have had something on on weed, but no, the judiciary <laughs> the judiciary committee went with this. And 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 I'm not trying to make. I understand where people are on this. I personally oppose Georgia's law as well, but uh, I, I do like making humor. So there were a couple of different panels. He had on the first panel. You had Senator Raphael Warnock. You had uh, who's a Democrat, obviously from Georgia. You had uh, Congressman Burgess Owens, who's a Republican from Utah. Uh, Burgess Owens being, uh, I think, one of two African American members of the House Republican Conference. Yep. Um, in um, the second panel, uh, you had Stacey Abrams, uh, who was billed as being the founder of Fair Fight Action, and obviously Stacey Abrams needs no no other introduction. If she is obviously from Georgia, ran for governor 2018. Uh, you had a couple other people. NAACP had representative. Uh, you had Emory University was represented. Uh, you had the state of New Hampshire and you had Jan Jones, who's the speaker pro tem of the Georgia House of Representative, Representatives and obviously a Republican, considering Republicans have the majority. I didn't get a chance to watch this hearing because I was busy watching a hearing in the House, in the House Judiciary Committee. It was a, a, a markup on a piece of legislation that I'm working on. Uh, so I missed I missed this and I haven't seen any clips from from what occurred. Um, what what the hell happened with this hearing yesterday? Because I got to imagine be, this this issue being so divisive, not just uh, post November third, post January sixth, 
uh, uh, you know, with all the t- the tensions that are still flaring up on the Hill. Their Politico had a story just yesterday about how there's been an exodus of staffers on the Hill who want to go do something else, and and because of the frustrations that that came from January 6th, and with this issue being called the new Jim Crow, being uh, with all the rhetoric that's that's uh, being used on both sides, um, I gotta imagine this this hearing was uh, was an interesting one to watch. Yeah, I watched uh, I watched a couple hours of it. Then I had to go to another meeting, but so I missed some of the fireworks that I saw. Uh, apparently, Tom Cotton and uh, and Ted Cruz tangled with uh, with Stacey Abrams, and you know I'm sure uh, who you thought won probably you know, debate. You know your priors probably determine who you thought came out ahead on that. But uh, I mean, uh, there there were some interesting things, and I was a little astounded right off the bat senator warnock was uh, the first person to speak and he encouraged people to not delve too deeply into the bill i'm not making this up don't delve too deeply in the bill because it will obscure uh, the real problems with it so that that was kind of a curious way to phrase it right uh, it, you know it, don't it, don't read don't look be- at the man behind the curtain yeah. don't look at the details let me tell you what it says yeah, let me let me keep you outraged. Yeah, and I, you know, look to a certain extent, I I can understand. Uh, you know, th- th- this is in the in the backdrop of of Trump's allegations that Georgia's election was not on the up and up. However, uh, the bill is the bill, and you know, if you're going to uh, talk about it factually, you have to look at the bill. Uh, Yes, and that's where that's where I think the real interesting part of the debate was. You know, uh, Stacey Abrams is you know very forcefully and and passionately uh, explained her side of things. Jan Jones, I thought, did a really good job explaining, you know, defending the bill, and then that that kind of set up. You know, not they didn't debate directly, but via the senators. Uh, you know that that they they really fleshed out. I think a lot of the arguments about uh, for and against the bill that we're going to hear over the next year and a half. So, and but look, really, the whole pretext of it was, uh, look at this horrible bill in Georgia. This is Jim Crow 2021, and that's why we need to pass uh, the the Senate or House version of the uh, uh, HR or SR one. Scott, before you before you say anything here, Buzz, let me ask you. Because I because I didn't watch the hearing, Jan Jones. I'm curious how she performed because I've always wondered whether she mm-hmm. might have some sort of federal ambitions. I, I would love her to have federal. I'll just lay it out. There. I would love her to have federal ambitions. Uh, Jan Jones, uh, I served with her. Scott served with her. One of the smartest people in the legislature, and really, in, in situations like this, especially, she does an amazing job of breaking a a complex piece of legislation down as we discussed this is 98 pages of very technical stuff she does a great job in these situations of breaking things down and explaining what's really going on and putting it in the broader context she kept she kept saying uh that look there have been in the last 10 years there have been 50 uh, uh elections bills passed in the state of georgia uh, one every, at least one every session has been signed in law. So you, when you put it in that context, a piece of legislation now is, is not that uncommon. It just happens to be on the heels of all sorts of other stuff that was raising everybody's hackles. So. Right, right. One of the big, big criticisms of the elections bill that just passed in Georgia is that it only happened because Trump yeah. was spreading disinformation. And that's simply you know, not the case if you look at history, but also one of the interesting things, one of the more interesting exchanges that's kind of related to this was between Ted Cruz and Stacey Abrams, where Ted Cruz point blank asked Stacey, do you still believe that the election was stolen from you? Because that was the, in 2018, that was the language she used. This was stolen from me and I will not concede because it was stolen from me. Now, during her answer to Ted and during the hearing yesterday, she backtracked a little bit. She tried to revise her statement. She tried to say, well, that's not exactly what I said. What I said was the system was broken and it was rigged, basically. She didn't use that word. She said the the, the rules of the game were set up so that people would be disenfranchised. And I'm paraphrasing there. That's not a, that's not a quote. 
Uh, but that was the point that she was making. Now, you know, the Senator Cruz came back and he was he talked about, well, if they're really disenfranchised, why are there more African-Americans participating in elections than any other state in Georgia? You know, uh, Georgia has more African-American participation in elections. Um, and I think he said the average was 60 percent in uh, registered voters were African-Americans and uh, African-American voters. That population was 64 yeah. percent in Georgia and, and and the average nationwide is 60. Mm-hmm. So we're above par in performance for making sure that African-Americans are registered to vote and can participate. And she, so in her backtracking, what she uh, may have inadvertently did was give legitimacy to, for the reason for elections bills. Yeah. Because she's, she was complaining for the last two years that the, the way the rules of the game were played were broken. And if you look at the bill that actually passed, a lot of the things that were of concern to her, the signature match issues, uh, the absentee ballot issues, those were addressed Mm -hmm. to to maximize participation across demographics. So she kind of gave, if the Republicans are smart, they'll hammer on that. They'll say, look, you can't say that everything was broken for the last two years and then criticize us for trying to fix the things that you said were broken. And that's exactly what she did. And I thought, I thought uh, Senator Cruz did a great job of kind of bringing that to light. Although I'm not seeing a lot of momentum. Well, I mean, well, there's, there are reasons for that. I mean, first of all, Senator, Senator Cruz has made himself an unsympathetic character on the national scale. Even, you know, I mean, I think, Last week, I, I showed that I had just gotten John Boehner's book. I mean, if you look at, if you read John Boehner's book, Ted Cruz is the great Satan. Um, you know, it's, on, uh, yeah, on, but yeah. I mean, that's John Boehner, right? I no, mean, I, 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 I understand. My, my point is, my point is, even a lot of Republicans don't like Ted Cruz. It's this is not just a this is not just a Democrat a Democratic uh, opinion. This is a opinion amongst even even some Republicans. Uh, We've even saved does, many, many Republicans, although that's, that's more speculation than anything else. But it does, I mean, it, yes, it's Stacey Abrams has been compl- very inconsistent. The rules, as Scott mentioned, the rules that defrauded her also brought about uh, uh, in 2020 a victory for Joe Biden and under the same circumstances and under the same set of rules. Lucy McBath, hello. Yeah, yeah. And, and then Carol, Carolyn Bordeaux in the, here in the 7th District where I live. So yeah, it, but it but it, the flip side of that, of course, is that Republicans uh, are, are, have the same inconsistencies. Uh, you know that th- this election was stolen, but uh, you know every senator, every Republican setting, senator sitting there uh, was elected in the same election, but their election is legitimate. So it's you know shocking news. Politicians are inconsistent. And, and, and Republicans threw everything they had at Lucy McBath in 2018 mm-hmm. during the midterms, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and 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 she still won. And right. and then uh, they also. I mean, I don't think she was as big a target in 2020. I think you know the seventh district was obviously the bigger the bigger yeah. keeping that red. But I think there was. I think even Republicans, if you privately asked them, knew they were going to lose that one too. That's why Rob yeah. Rob Woodall didn't run for reelection. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, the, the stuff with Abrams. I, I I do think she. Oh yeah, look, I remember some of the things she was saying in 2018, uh, sitting because I was sitting in the Freedom Works office that night, and even in the days after, after tracking what was happening in Georgia and seeing some of the things she said, she very clearly made it made it yeah. stated that there was that there were there were shenanigans happening on the backside. Yeah, yeah, uh, that yeah. wasn't that was not a that was not a casual thing that was, well, she said it very casually. This was not a, this was not something that she suggested or, or. I would say she said it passionately. Yeah. She, she she was attacking the system. And then now when changes have been made and in back-to-back legislative uh, bienniums, she's all of a sudden uh, attacking the changes. And, you know, to the point where that buzz made earlier, Senator Warnock is saying, don't look at the details. That'll, yeah. that'll calm you down. Right. And I need you to be mad. So <laughs> listen to me and don't read. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, but and that's ultimately the thing at the end of the day. I mean, and we, uh, you know, I've talked about this with other people and we may have even talked about this on here, the outrage machine, the, the, the desire to keep people, to keep people pissed off, 
yeah. is I mean it's 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 how it's how these groups it's a lot 501c3s 501c well more 501c4s than anything else because they're all gra- many of them are grassroots based or advocacy based the the whole name of the game is to keep people pissed off and keep yeah. keep keep the clicks on those emails or tweets coming that is that is what they want to do and solely what they want to do yep yeah that's well, what one keeps last... them relevant right no there's yeah. a fu- there is there is a there is a financial interest in in for some of these organizations to keep doing that mm-hmm. uh and, and you know I want to be very clear here. I am not making allusions to anything because I realize I work for a 501 C4. We don't have a, we don't have a grassroots component. We don't have a membership. <laughs> uh, we are, we are just, we are just advocacy. We just lobby. That's all we do. Uh, I write, I, I think I'll be, I've been on my job for almost two months and I think I'll be writing my first blog post this week. Uh, so we don't, we have four staffers and that's it. My point is, though, they're the, the groups who engage, engage in a lot of these hot button issues and, and, and they do it, they want to keep money flowing. And, and so they yeah. engage in ways to, to juice the rage. Sure. Yeah. Well, what, one uh, last thing I'll mention about this. Stacey Abrams said and, and reiterated it under questioning several times. She said she supports voter ID. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. That's the first time I ever heard her say that. She said what she opposes is restrictive voter ID. She wasn't really pressed. I, I'd, I'd love to hear from her what what that means, because I think every, you know, if, if you don't have a particular form of ID, then that's, you know, could be termed restrictive. Uh, so I don't know what she means by restrictive voter ID, uh, because Georgia allows for a numerous yeah, uh, forms of identification. And then it, even in this newest bill, it allows you to use the last four digits of your social security number. So, right. I mean, I, in I, lieu I, of a photo ID, you can use the last four yeah. digits of your social security number. I, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the the criticism of that aspect of the bill is, again, it's just designed to create outrage. Yeah. But wouldn't you, I think it's, wouldn't when you get, get back to, if po- polling shows that uh, a wide, uh, a, a solid swath of Americans across the political political spectrum support the use of voter id mm-hmm. so that's probably why she's hedging her bets on that <laughs> no, well maybe maybe so but the one thing the one thing that i'll say here as it relates to restrictive voting voter id and maybe she didn't say this and again i didn't watch the hearing you know the the absentee the voter id requirement that comes without absentee ballots that's that's restrictive i mean that's going to that's going to lead to people not yeah. Oh, come on, Scott. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. It, I, I disagree completely because it's the same ID that you would show if you voted uh, in person. And if you don't have one of those, first of all, you can get a free one. The state will provide one for mm-hmm. you. And secondly, I mean, you could use your concealed carry license to go vote. But you, but if you don't have that, there are all these other options that are built into the bill, including just simply providing the last four digits of your social and every American so let, is, is going to have that at this point. Let me, let me, let me ask you a quick question because so how does, how does this work and function? So it, and, and when it's, when it's all said and done, when I, when I go to my County, when I go on my County website and either and request an absentee ballot or go to the, 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 my voter page on the secretary of state's office and request my, my ballot, wh- where's the element where I have to work, I have to give my voter ID. And, and who do I have to give it to? Because if I have to go to the Newton County uh, b- uh, uh, County Commission Office, the Board of Elections Office down there, and and physically show my ID to them uh, to to turn my ballot in or get my ballot, whatever the case may be, I mean that defeats the purpose in some respects. Uh, then the other equation is: Okay, do I have to scan it and, and give it to them? When no, if you don't have any of that, you just it's on the form. It's going to be a block in the form. You write down your driver's mm-hmm. license number yeah. or your uh, last four years social, and that's it. You don't have to make a photocopy. Period. Okay, but, so let me let me ask so you: It's as restrictive as reaching into your wallet, pulling out your ID, <laughs> and copying the driver's license number off of your ID and onto the form when you're filling out the form to request but your But what was wrong with the old way? Signature verification. What was wrong with the old way? Why change? Because there were several instances where you had lawmakers intentionally skew their signatures to, to make it completely not like the one that was on record. And they still got their ballot and cast their ballot and nobody ever blinked an eye at it. And so 
that created questions in the, uh, in the, in the minds of the lawmakers as to whether or not it was a valid process. There's, that's the reason why is you had, and it wasn't just one, there were a couple that did this where they intentionally requested a mail-in ballot and wrote their signature differently than what they had on their file. But signature audits show no, no examples of any, any widespread voter fraud, voter fraud. So no, that's true. I, th I think what I, I guess from my standpoint, the, the concern I have is the rejection of ballots. I, I, I may be rare among Republicans. I don't want anybody's ballot to be rejected if they're a right. legitimate person. It seems to me the process that we have, even, even under the infamous uh, consent agreement that Brad Raffensperger, you know, controversially signed, it's subjective. It's up to the eyeballs of a handful of people in an elections office. Right. I don't know who those people are who may not like me or may not, you know, may know that I vote a certain way and don't want my vote to count. Uh, I, 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 is, I want to remove as much subjectivity to this process out of the process as is possible. Perfect. And I think uh, this does it. it a, a, a perfect example, when I, when I was uh, looking into Colorado's laws, Colorado is, of course, a mail-in state, a male-only male, a male -only state. Uh, they reject about, they use signature verification. They reject about one and a half to two percent of, of ballots every year. Uh, and, and that would translate in, in this last election, that would have been 80,000 people's ballots got tossed out. That's, that's a lot of folks. That's, you know, five right. times uh, the margin of, of victory for Joe Biden. So I, I, I think you know, removing the subjectivity as much as possible is, in, you know, is, is better. Yeah. And, and that's the, and that's the real benefit, right? And is, right. is even though our signature match audit came back and I, I never saw the, the results from the full state audit. I only saw from key counties uh, after the November election and, and only after months of begging for the audit to happen, uh, it, they they were able to find just a handful, which wouldn't have made the margin, right? But we used to reject at an obscene amount of ballots because of our signature match here in Georgia. And now you're removing that altogether. And if Stacey Abrams wants to complain about disenfranchisement, well, signature match disenfranchised voters. It's the opposite of what she's arguing for. It, because you all you needed was one uh, several years ago, this, and then I say several, it's like three years ago, all you needed was one person to say that's not a match, and it was done. Yeah. That person's ballot was tossed. So since right before we came, right before we came on, uh, on air, or I guess I should say started recording, um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution released a uh, poll a uh, survey on on the the voter law, and it, it's yeah. it's broken down by its individual provisions, or at least the the substance of the individual pr provisions. So it's something that's worth going and looking at if you're interested in, in seeing how Georgians are actually viewing the law. Uh, and they, look, there there are parts of the bill that have uh, pretty pretty broad support. There are parts of the bill that that don't. Uh, yeah. But the 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 story for those of you who are who are um, who are watching the stories called polls show deep divisions over Georgia's voting law. Yeah. Uh, I will link that um, in the blog post uh, at yeah. peachfunded.com so people can go and take a look at it. But moving along, because we've been on this for a few minutes now. Yeah. Um, so there's other, there's other Georgia related news out of Washington, DC. Uh, and this one, uh, this one, I have no sympathy for Marjorie Taylor Greene. I didn't have any before this story. This made me just dislike her even more, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, so last week, uh, the I forget the name of the the publication, but it's a bunch of former Politico reporters. Punchbowl. Punchbowl. That's right, Punchbowl, who who discovered a um, who discovered uh, <laughs> what Marjorie Taylor Greene says is a staff level document written by an outside group uh, that basically showed the planks, the policy planks of what sh what was supposed to become the America First Caucus. And there were some pretty, uh, I would use the term dog whistle uh, type language in there, uh, the reference to uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, norms, I think, or, or, or history or whatever. Values. The, values. Anglo that's what it was. Anglo-Saxon values. I don't values. I, I don't even know who uses that term. And, but what and, does it mean? Yeah. I mean, the Vikings coming over to you know, impose their will upon us. I don't well, know. Well, the, the that... really the really funny thing about it was because uh, so Alex Alex Narastra at Cato 
he does immigration there and he, he you know he ha- he has views that are probably depart from the two of you on immigration they don't really depart from what i believe on immigration uh, but alex said the really funny thing was that one of the he's he referred to the magna carta which you know this is this is 11th century to, or to 12th 13th century yeah. i don't remember which century it was <laughs> uh you know document that basically protected the free flow of movement between you know across borders and saying that the, the anglo-saxon anglo-saxon sex and saxon values essentially saying that um that restriction restrictions on immigration were something that were an anglo-saxon uh belief <laughs> no it, it really wasn't <laughs> yeah anglo-saxons are believed in open borders is essentially but but and, and that phrase appeared I didn't read the entire document. I couldn't couldn't stand it. Yeah, uh, um, not because look, the America First idea. I understand why people are passionate about that, mm-hmm. and I don't necessarily disagree with some of of that concept because there, I think there is a, a value in making sure that we're taking care of our own. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to dis- destroy the entire thing, but it uses it used phrases that I just didn't understand. I don't connect with yeah. Anglo-Saxon values. I don't know what that means. Like I, what did it, because it, it was mentioned specifically in the immigration section. And so if you're a student of history, it didn't, it didn't quite match up with what an Anglo-Saxon thing is, but Jason, could you talk a little bit about, maybe you have a little insight being in DC a little more than us. <laughs> Um, like she's now, is she backtracking from this? Is she, you know, is she disavowing it? What, what is her posture with it? Yeah. Her posture has basically been that, uh, that the media is attacking her, uh, that the, that this was a staff level document that was written by some sort of outside group, uh, and that the caucus was not, um, was not something that was close to being to coming to fruition, that this was not something she had approved. This language is not something she had approved. And that everybody, everybody who's criticizing her are the worst possible people. That's just simply, she, she, I think she used the term, um, I want to say she used the term scum, scum, media scum at one point. I can't remember if that's an exact (laughs) term or not, but I think she did use something similar to it. Uh, Basically everything she could to blame everyone else, but her, herself and her staff over this. And and the way it strikes me is like some 20 something year old kid who has who who has way too much time on their hands and thinks that they're some sort of expert in medieval history probably in, in this kid is obviously someone who is not of color wrote this document and uh it got leaked in some way personally i believe she got caught she got caught red-handed and she's trying to distance herself as quickly as she can that's what i think uh but she is trying to backtrack the caucus uh is officially well, I don't. I can't say whether it's been the the plug has been pulled because if you look at her staff on Friday, her communications person, uh, who she should have already fired given some of the things that he said, uh, he was back. He was saying it was happening that this was this was the agenda that this is set in stone and they're moving forward with it. Yeah, <laughs> but she she said quite some, something quite differently over the weekend. But uh, uh, there, there, she had another Republican member, Paul Gosar from Arizona. Uh, there was somebody else who I don't remember who was who the third person was who was helping launch this, and uh, supposedly Matt Gates said he was going to join it as well. I, I recall seeing something like that over the weekend, and it's just like par for the course, bro. You know, um, yeah. So he's um, got other problems. <laughs> he has yeah. <laughs> he has other problems, but his fundraising numbers are not one of them. He raised two million dollars. So he has two he has two million cash on hand, I should say. Well, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene raised a ton of money too. She, she was like six or six or eight or something like that, wasn't she? No, I think she raised. Uh, oh, was it three, two, three, 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 oh, okay, yeah. three point two million. Jeez, I mean, so at the end of the day, with when it's all said and done, like the the condemnation inside uh, has been pretty strong. I mean, yeah. Republicans, House Republicans, are once again forced to to distance themselves from Marjorie Taylor Greene, yeah. uh, who who has once again embarrassed them. Yep, and so I, I, I'm gonna. I'm going to repeat part of a conversation that I'm not going to say who I had this with, but this was not someone in Georgia, um, but it was with a, uh, a staffer who, who works for a high ranking house official, a house member. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I'll say that the staffer, I, I, when, when she got elected on election day, 
it may have even been before election day when I said, when we had this conversation, I said, I asked him, I was like, are you guys going to immediately move to make her mark, like to marginalize her? And he's more than she already is. <laughs> this, this is, this is before she, she, this is, okay. this, this might've been before the election. It, okay. If not, it was at, it might've been right after the election, but I was driving to DC when I had the conversation with the staffer. And he said, I think he goes, look, um, he said, uh, he said that the, the, they're going to give her, they're going to give her opportunities to succeed. Uh, and if she wants to, if she wants to play ball with the conference and, and go along with Republican priorities, great. If she doesn't, we're going to give her, we're going to give her opportunities to show herself. And then at, there will be a point where we, we cut bait. Uh, the way I, it was, I, I know there were, sorry, go ahead. The way it was put to me was she was going to be given three strikes. Yeah. Where, where, how, what are the balls and strikes right now? That's what yeah. I'm curious about. I, I know there were people in the district who uh, who attempted to reach out to her, uh, well, not just in the district, across the state, who reached out to her to say, hey, nobody's got a problem with you being a conservative, but, you know, chill. And obviously that message was not uh, received. So... <laughs> Yeah, I don't so, know. She's on strike six or seven or eight. I don't know what's what strike she's I on. Saw, yeah, I saw her. I saw her at something um, right after the election, and I wondered. I actually expected her to talk more than she did, mm -hmm. and she had a couple one of her one or two of her staffers with her. She I expected her to talk more than she did, and she barely said a word the entire time I was there. Granted, I was only there for about an hour and a half. It was a, they were doing an all day thing, and. Um, yeah, she 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 barely said anything, but like so I was like, oh, maybe, maybe she's gonna behave. You know, maybe she's gonna distance herself yeah. from from the crazy. But a, a friend of mine who a friend of mine who works for a or worked I should say for a prominent uh, conservative movement based organization tried to convince me to give her a quote unquote chance because her legislative director is quote unquote a libertarian, and uh, I did not even. I, it was hard for me to even consider what he was saying, especially who was saying it to me, because it's, I respect this person. But um, it's like, how can how can you be blinded by this? Because like she's, I look at her and see she's crazy. All she's done is prove me right. You know, since 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 she, I mean, since well, look, we, look, look, she got elected. Lots of lots of people who get elected campaign one way and try to govern a different way. Oh, I of mean, course. And, and so. I think the mentality of well, Jerry Keene three... made a career on that when he was House Majority Leader. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, great, great Georgia-based example. Uh, if even if obscure to most people, the, but the reality is that it, it, it's only appropriate if somebody is being elected for the first time to give them the opportunity to try to be a serious person and try to be a serious legislator. It's an important every, job. I, I think. I think after she won the runoff, until the, the November election she wasn't all that crazy. I, I think it was the, the, the idea that, well, I, I guess saying crazy things you know, was limited during that period of time. It was the election and the idea that, that, uh, that Trump was defrauded that uh, sent her down this path, revealed her, maybe, maybe revealed her true colors or sent her down this path or whatever, but, you know, yeah, and then the, the QAnon stuff came out. You know, she had yeah. she was an early adopter of that particular mm -hmm. conspiracy theory, and she had she had distanced herself from that because it never came up during the campaign. Right. It yeah. was only after her her belief in other conspiracy theories became apparent that she started to have to deal with that again. Right. So one of, one of the things I'm hearing because I am talking to a lot of a lot of House and Senate Republican offices. So it's not it is not out of the ordinary for her name to come up in a conversation. Uh, for those of you who don't, who are not familiar with House minutia, uh, usually the first couple of days of the week are reserved for what we call suspension suspension bills. These are bills that they suspend the rules and pass either by voice vote uh, or by roll call vote as long as two thirds of the or three no it's, yeah two thirds of the House yeah. are present in voting. So the, these the threshold in a, when the House is at uh, you know, full capacity, 435 is 291 votes. Um, so these bills typically are not controversial. 
Yeah. These are these are post office renamings, and and not always, but a, a large chunk of them are not probably not a majority, but a large chunk of them. These are these are mundane pieces of legislation uh, that typically have some measure of bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. uh, so what she and the House Freedom Caucus are doing, uh, at least some members of the Freedom Caucus, not all of them, they are going to the floor and and requesting roll call votes on a lot of these bills. <laughs> Uh, these are these are bills that might ordinarily have been voice voted out. Yeah, and it's it is pissing off everyone. Not just that, <laughs> well, they're not just owning the libs here; they're pissing off their own side. Sure. And you know but, how they're you know how they're getting around it now, Scott? No, huh? They're Tell packaging me. they're packaging the bills on block. <laughs> so it's omnibus uh, post name uh, uh, post office naming bills. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not it's not it's not omnibus bill. They're, they're just basically like. The rules committee will 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 basically say like we're doing these on block and we'll just we'll send them to the floor. And sort of like what Georgia does with local legislation. You know, we right. vote it. We vote calendar. seven bills on one calendar. Yeah. Okay. So I I get it. Um, uh, there's a our, a guy from our chat named Cannon Fodder. We'll give him a shout out because he's actually participating. In, or I'm going to say they, and because I don't know if it's a guy or girl. Don't assume. Uh, don't assume his or her gender. Or right. Place, I'm not. I'm not. The, Cannon Fodder says on our chat she gives libertarians a bad name and her guy does rather uh, so uh, do you do you think do you consider her to be a libertarian jason hell god no uh -huh. no so and, and, and well the, there's but, a lot of people who don't re, don't don't refer to her as a republican either um, well she's yeah. not she's not a libertarian the closest thing i could say i would say she comes to is probably like a paleo conservative uh you know like but I, yeah. she's not a libertarian and i don't know what that means what is paleo conservative it's like it's like old What's that? Well, uh, uh, William F. Buckley, I don't. I, he would probably call himself a paleoconservative, but I, I think it, she's different. She, she's a. I think the best way to describe her, she's a Trump era cons Republican, conservative. In that, it's a mix of populism and nationalism, and um, you know, with, with it's not a consistent conservative in, by no. any as, as traditionally known. Scott, so uh, I wanted to make this point uh, specifically about um her her joining in with this group of people who are trying to slow things down intentionally and this is the problem with the politics of retribution in general okay uh we see it sometimes in the house of representatives with certain members when you take away incentives for somebody to go along like mm -hmm. strip them of committees just being on a committee and you tell them you're not going to do anything. You you have incentivized this type of behavior from yeah. her, and and it's a leadership style. Now I understand it's been done in memoriam, and this is the way it's always been done. But we can't be all that shocked when you tell somebody who's ambition driven that we're going to take everything away from you, and then expect them just to go away. They're not yeah. going to go away. And so we we there has to be a a, a better way of of managing the situation when somebody does something outrageous yeah the the, the one thing I, I actually would i i i applauded the move to strip her of her committee assignments she was she was on two committees she was on ed and labor and i can't remember the other one off the top of my head uh, but uh, I, the thing is i knew i i applauded for two for two reasons this was the most punitive action they could take against her without short of expelling her from the house they could have censured her without I, removing her no they, her they ability they, to do work they they could have but i mean i i think i think censure and yeah, that's right i actually second we'll say second most uh you know but censure would have been the would have been the strongest non-expulsion you're right um you write that down scott i said you were right about something uh, um, a, you know i'm gonna celebrate 421 <laughs> for the rest thing. of my life <laughs> so uh so but they they don't want to they don't want to expel her and i think i might have used this example it would be it, worse well it, I, I might have used this example uh previously there's there's a in the first season of the west wing joey lucas comes in she wants uh she wants a democrat who can beat a republican to, to run in the seat and they josh lyman basically says no i don't i don't want a democrat to beat him this guy's worth two million dollars every time he says something stupid yeah. <laughs> and it's the same with Marjorie Taylor Greene. She right. goes out and says something stupid. She goes out and talks about QAnon or talks or, you know, she's uh, she's def 
whatever you name whatever she she'll say um like yesterday she didn't say anything about the the george floyd verdict sure she did she went after maxine waters it, that's exactly well yeah but she didn't you're right she did she didn't say anything directly about it she went after a, a, a black democrat yeah you were saying that, something that was equally outrageous for some of the things that she has said <laughs> I, i'm not i'm not disputing that my point is that given the state of politics today where everything is so divisive the dnc or the 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 triple c can go out and raise two million dollars on the stupid shit she, she says and that's yeah. that's that's it doesn't it, the, the you I get what you're saying. Yeah, I get my, what you're saying. My, my point is my point is perception. It's not, and, and per- perception is reality. That's that's true. But the perception is that she is representative of the Republican Party, and it's to. But that may not be true. But she is. She represents everything that's wrong with the Republican Party. And going back to the to the point about the 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 saying saying that she gives libertarians a bad name, is why I'm increasingly using the term I am uh, to the classical liberal to describe my political viewpoint. I realize liberal is viewed very poorly. Classical liberalism in the mold of John Locke and F, uh, uh, John Locke and Adam Smith. That is what I subscribe to. Yeah, sure. And, and Thomas Jefferson and the founding fathers. I doubt that Marjorie Taylor Greene's ever re- read a single passage that was written by John Locke. <laughs> I would agree with you. She, she, she is not, she is not, from my perspective, a conservative. Well, I don't think she's a conservative at all. I think she's an agitator. Mm-hmm. I think that's what that, that is. Well, she, that is absolutely true, but sure. it's also the role they created for her, you know? And so maybe there's some greater plan on the Dem side to keep her in that role because it's, it's pretty predictable that how she's going to react. Uh, and, and she has, she has given them the, the the club to beat certain Republicans with. When you're in the minority, Scott, though, you want you want. I don't like that that they made Jim Jordan the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee. I would like a serious legislator there, but he was a good ranking member of the Oversight and uh, Government Reform Committee. That that's uh, OGR for short. He he was a he would have been a good ranking member because that's the bulldog type you want going in and flobbing bombs at the other side. Well, uh, so Jim Jordan's good at debate and interactions right so his ability to on the fly see an argument being developed and then attack the, the weaker points of it is well established and, and i don't think that it, that that representative green has that ability no she doesn't she doesn't have that ability but he's about my point is he's the type of person you want going out on fox news and feeding red meat to the base getting them fired up marjorie taylor green is not the type of person she She's not the type of person you want. Yes, she might appeal to part of the base, but she's going to embarrass you in the long run. So there's a there's a there's a big a big line between the right type of crazy and the wrong type of crazy. And I don't really care for Jim Jordan, but he is effective at what he does as much as it pisses me off like he did yesterday in that committee hearing. Uh, moving moving along we got a couple more subjects so uh i did i did not go to any republican party conventions uh this this past weekend because i had better things to do with my time like build a fence in my backyard uh and you're not a republican and i'm not a republican uh so uh, but i understand that the, the the there were some resolutions aimed at some georgia republican officials uh, Governor Kemp, Secretary of State Raffensperger, uh, and I think there will might have even been a couple like, aimed at Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan. Uh, I didn't go. Buzz Scott, I don't know if you guys did, but please tell me how this went down. <laughs> it, uh, I, I attended the Gwinnett Convention, and just to be honest with you, I, I, read, I wrote a post on Peach Pundit about this. This is one of the main reasons I went is to stand up and say these resolutions are ridiculous and we ought to vote them down. Thankfully. In Gwinnett County, they were voted well. the 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 uh, resolution condemning Governor Kemp was voted down, and then a motion to adjourn was made before uh, resolutions against Kemp or against uh, Duncan or or Raffensperger could be made. And everybody, being three o'clock or afterward, everybody decided, yeah, let's get the heck out of here. Uh, but they they were passed in. Um, I don't know what the total count is now. It may maybe it's up to fifteen or twenty. I don't know. Uh, but it's just, out of 159 counties, that's a pretty small number. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, there, there, there is a little bit of work probably that Brian Kemp needs to do to shore up his support because it seems that many of these counties were rural counties, which were the base of his support uh, the last time he uh, ran for governor. So he's probably got a little work to do. But you know, the the it seems to me the media reaction, and I like the reporters who are reporting this, and obviously I, I don't. 
I get why they're doing it. This is news that somebody's that members of his own party are criticizing him. But if you looked at the media reaction, you'd think that this, you know, that Brian Kemp is about to ride back to Athens in shame and and, and fold up this tent. But it, it fizzled out. Honestly, it, it, it is is the best way I can describe it. Scott, yeah. did you Fizz- go to did you go to the, the- I, I I didn't, but I got a play by play. So uh, my personal situation is, you know, I have somebody in hospice care living with us. So uh, going out right now requires a lot of um, coordination, I guess. And I, I had planned to go and it just turned out I couldn't I had to be at home. But I had somebody there who I spoke with, uh, who's been a longtime activist. You know, what did happen at our Cherokee County Convention for the Republican side was that we uh, we tossed our existing leadership by wide margins and replaced every single person that that was on the executive committee with somebody who was brand new and had never served at any party level ever anywhere. And so we have a completely fresh crop of our executive committee in Cherokee County now. That being said, when it got the resolutions, there was only one resolution that was brought to the floor, and it was for uh, to urge Republican events to uh, do away with the use of Coca-Cola products. Um, That was (laughs) the one thing that passed in the form of a resolution out of the Cherokee County Republican Party Convention. All other all other. resolutions and they were considered by resolutions committee we did not make the floor for a vote yeah. and i don't know that they would have had the support had they uh to be honest with you uh brian kemp remains fairly popular here in cherokee county now cherokee county is a is a republican stronghold we're 80 percent republican we had more votes uh than the margin of victory for brian kemp over stacy abrams right here in this one county uh, so we kind of delivered the governor's mansion to Brian Kemp. So I don't think we're going anywhere, uh, governor. So, uh, we still love you here. Uh, and there are, I won't say the same thing for secretary Raffensperger. I know we've talked about his office ad nauseum on this podcast. Uh, I think that there's probably a groundswell of support for doing away with him here. And, uh, you know, who knows what happens with Lieutenant governor Duncan at this point. I noticed I noticed uh, maybe late last week, early this week, uh, when I logged into our Twitter account, Peach Pundit's Twitter account, that we had a, a, an interesting follow from, I believe, the Secretary of State's, uh, one of the Secretary of State's communication staffers. So, <laughs> um, so uh, we are, we might be being watched. Uh, this is the one thing I want to say to the Secretary of State. We don't want to talk about y'all. We're done. <laughs> we don't want to. You keep doing this stuff that we, it forces us to have to talk about you just stop and we will. I yeah. Mean, that's really what it's about. Yeah. I, it is I, important. Like uh, David Bell Isle, as we mentioned, is one of the people who's announced he's going to, he's primarying uh, Brad Raffensperger. He came to Gwinnett and spoke uh, and he, you know, he, he went after uh, Raffensperger pretty hard and got a lot of applause, but it's important. I think it's important to always remember in, in Republicans tend to, especially Republican activists tend to forget this. They're a tiny slice of the Republican Party. They don't necessarily reflect the views of the broader Republican Party that shows up at the polls. And then that's not to say that Raffensperger is not in trouble. I think he, he, he probably has an uphill climb in a Republican primary. But if it were determined only by the uh, by the views of those who show up at conventions, yeah, he'd he'd be toast. No well, doubt. you would be Secretary of State, right? I mean, you I mean, yeah, me and Josh McCoon would have finished first and second in that in <laughs> yeah. primary, you know. Right. Uh, I mean, there then, there there, there, no. there is something to be there is something to be said for for uh, you know a state convention nominating process. We the, the, you know that gave us you know Senator Mike Lee, who is who is you know my favorite senator. Uh, but it's also going to, I mean, they do that in Virginia, or at least they used to, yeah. I think they still do. And they could get, uh, you know, a, a very uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene style yeah. candidate for governor uh, up there. No Oops, I, I randomly wound up on her email list. I don't know how that happened, but uh, I am, I, <laughs> I unsubscribed as soon as I saw it come through my inbox. So, uh, but hey, let's, uh, um, let's speculate wildly on, um, since we're, we're talking about candidates, uh, let's speculate wildly on some people's political futures. So, so I was gonna, uh, I was, I was, I was heading there. Um, uh, cause, uh, cause I was, that's the whole reason I blog to make wild speculation. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, so engaging in wild speculation, which I was gonna do buzz. 
so we we have a new candidate uh, in the the Republican primary for for governor. Uh, right now, he's the only other candidate other than uh, Governor Brian Kemp, and that is Vernon Jones, the state house state uh, state representative from uh, well, I don't know you know what I know he's DeKalb, DeKalb County. I know he's yeah. DeKalb County. I just don't know. It's what. all the same in DeKalb County. Just call it DeKalb County. <laughs> just call yeah. Just call the county Decatur basically because that's really all that matters. <laughs> Um, so he's running against Brian Kemp for governor, and uh, he had some supportive tweets from Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Ber- Bernie Carrick tweeted at David Schaefer and asked him why he hadn't put out a, a press statement on Vernon Jones's candidacy. Which uh, <laughs> Bernie Carrick was at at Vernon's announcement, by the way. Oh, I, he was. I, I, oh, he was one of the three people there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like so the other podcast I do. We have we always joke that we have dozens of listeners. Like we have more. We have dozens of listeners. We still have more listeners than people who showed up at Vernon Jones's press conference. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are more press there too, but yeah. So it's it's yeah, probably yeah. Uh, if, if you took the press away from that announcement, it would have more than half of the crowd would have left. No, I noticed. I noticed because I was like googling stuff real fast so I could get a, a blog post up uh, that you know this was covered by the Washington Examiner, was covered by the Daily Caller. Uh, some of the, you know, I don't know if Breitbart did something, but I refuse to ever visit Breitbart's website for anything, but, uh, um, you hate a lot of things. Bro. I really do. It's <laughs> I, I, like, I didn't even oh. want to go. I didn't even want to go on the daily caller. I do read the and, examiner from yeah. time to time though. World Andrew Breitbart would be ashamed of his site these days. Yeah, so. Oh yes, he would. Yes, he would. Uh, but it, I mean, Breitbart was such a nice guy. I met him a couple of times. He was a really nice guy. Um, but so you're, you have this campaign, you have. Uh, what basically was a low impact announcement, even though it got a lot of press coverage, like the number of people who were there was not something that was necessarily exciting. Um, what, Vernon Jones to me seems like he's some, this is something he's going to do for a little bit, maybe raise some money and then drop out. No, nah, I don't think so. I think you think he's, he's, he's going to see it through. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, I think he believes he can ride the Trump wave to success here. I, he, now does he, is that a reality? I don't know that reality really matters a whole lot. If you watch some of the things he's, he puts out on Twitter, things like if if Trump had won Georgia, then we'd have President Trump. I yeah. mean, he, it ignores the fact that there were at least three other states that would have had to have flipped yeah. um, by much wider var- margins than what Georgia had to overcome for President Trump in order for him to win. Uh, he, those are the types of statements that he makes. And he's willing to flip-flop on his long-held political beliefs to stand in front of a crowd to hear them cheer for him. You know, I watched his press conference. He's, you know, he's a, he's a very impassioned speaker and he was doing his best to fire up the dozen or so people that were actually there. And I'm not exaggerating, you know, uh, outside of the media, there were, it couldn't have been more than 25 people um, that showed up for this major announcement. And I think, I think he thinks, that the more he's the longer he's going to be in it the better his chances are i just i don't there's there's also the trump the trump's the x factor here if if a more credible anti-kemp pro-trump candidate doesn't emerge then trump i would not shock me if trump endorsed vernon jones vernon vernon was very supportive and loyal to him and trump wants kemp gone so at least at least he'll hang around until that decision is made and I think that decision has been made. I think the president has made statements indicating he wanted Vernon to run against Brian Kemp. Mm-hmm. And that's why Representative Jones decided to throw his hat in the ring was because sure. he, he thinks he's going to have that support. And it's then that support's going to matter, you know, and it and it might damage uh, Kemp a little in the maybe even, a, you know, a significant I wouldn't say he that Kemp's in danger of losing the nomination to Vernon Jones, but I don't see a world in which somebody who just a couple of years ago was voting ultra liberal uh, can run from that record, you know? And yeah. I think, I think, you know, Brian Kemp is an excellent campaigner. You know, he, he, he jumped from third or fourth to win the nomination. Mm-hmm. Uh, his campaign team is well-established. They know the pulse of especially rural Georgia and how to connect there. And he, Brian Kemp is an excellent retail politician yes he 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 will go and shake hands with every single person in south georgia if he has to and and turn on the southern charm and say listen i i'm representing your values i'm working hard for you i'm sorry we disagreed on this one thing but 
what's at stake here? Do you want to somebody with point. a liberal record like Vernon Jones really taking the reins of this state? Yeah. To, to when, the, when, to, I ran, when I ran for Secretary of State, I tra as I traveled around the state, I, I was shocked to, to see, you know, every, every, uh, every mayor, every city councilman, every head of local chamber of commerce had all met Brian Kemp and all liked him. That doesn't mean they all voted for him, but they all had relationships with him that he had built up over years and years. And that's what, that's what won in the governor's mansion the first time, you know, it's not a guarantee that he, that he wins reelection, of course, but he's, he's got, he's got long time friendships with thousands and thousands and thousands of leaders in every community across this state. So. No, I'll, I'll, I'll add, I'll add here that anytime I've seen, him around Brian Kemp around uh, before he became governor. I, he, every time he saw me, he would make a point to say hello. Yeah. Uh, I think I was, I think I was at the red state gathering in 2016 out in Denver and he, Brian was there speaking and he just, he sees me. He's like, he just comes over and says, hello, Joel McElhannon was with him. And I remember rolling my eyes when I saw Joel McElhannon, uh, but uh, stop hating everything. <laughs> I, that doesn't imply hatred. That applies annoy, implies annoyance. Stop being annoyed by everything. Now that I, <laughs> that, that that I will not do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I, I I say that to, I say I know that to say like that. And when Kip became governor, uh, you know, I it was it, the problem I had with him was the people he had surrounded himself. Well, well, one I didn't like the rhetoric he used in his campaign because mm -hmm. I you know it did that stuff sort of stuff just doesn't appeal to me. And the other side of the equation was. The people he surrounded himself with and some of that has relates to stuff that had happened out here in newton county uh you know years before uh but i but i never i've never thought negatively of brian as a person yeah I, i've always thought he's a very very kind and and good guy yeah i mean and that that shows in his leadership style uh, you know the the uh, willingness to bury hatchets and just focus on the task at hand was something I found to be refreshing. Uh, and, you know, my first six years in the legislature were dominated with, uh, you know, if I disagreed with the governor one time, I was going to have a really hard time getting anything else done. You know, that wasn't the case with Brian Kemp. You know, Brian Kemp would say, I think one of the phrases he likes to use is you can come to church with me. I just may not let you sing in the choir. You know, you can be, you know, we can worship the Lord together, but you're, you're, uh, you know, I, you know, and, and when it comes time, I'm going to need you, but you, you're not going to be in my inner circle kind of thing, which is fine. Right. That's way better than I disagreed with you one time and I'm going to write you off forever, um, which was the, really the case in the previous administration. I, I mean, I've done that with you you know, before Scott, I've, I've, I mean, I've completely <laughs> written you off. Like, You've written I, off. You'll probably be written off again. I let, I let you, I let you on this podcast simply because Buzz convinced me to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So no, right. In, in all seriousness, a uh, couple, so we have, we have, <laughs> I think this podcast was my idea. <laughs> I, I think, I think it might, I think it might have been. Uh, so we got, we got this, I got one more thing on, on who, who might, who may or may not be running. And then I got one more thing I want to discuss. And I think that one may, may eat up a couple more minutes of our time and we're running up on an hour already, but I do want to say, see, you're hearing Stacey Abrams or hearing that she was going to be in this hearing uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the new Jim Crow in the South uh, certainly did uh, make me think that it's, it was potentially another platform for her uh, to, to gain momentum uh, as she approaches a decision on 2022 and whether or not she's going to run for governor against governor Kemp. Uh what, what did, I mean, did she look like a candidate? Did, did she, t did she talk like a candidate? I thought she did poorly. Um, again, going back to the very beginning of our conversation, I think she inadvertently laid out a defense for Republicans to say even Stacey Abrams agreed that the rules need to be changed. Um, so I, I, and that's not something I would say is normal from her. I, th I think she's far more savvy most of the time than to it's kind of uh, accidentally stumble upon some phrasing that wasn't intricately pre-planned. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I my, if I was a betting man today, in spite of all the other rumors that we're hearing, I'd bet that she's in. See, I'd, I'd bet that she's not in. And, and it is partially because there, there are rumors floating around that she, she uh, is not going to run. Um, but uh, I also, I guess I, I, I look at her and I, and I see a person who's, not gearing up to run a campaign that she's 
she's gearing up to continue uh, what she's been doing, which is raising a ton of money, uh, writing. She's got a new novel out uh, out recently. She's uh, uh, just nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, uh, and but what for a while now, when she answers questions, of course, anytime she makes a media appearance, they're going to ask her, "Are you running for governor?" And normally, I would, I guess, I would expect a person who's thinking about it to say, "Well, we're evaluating that," or you know, "Soon, I will be thinking about that." That's not what she says. She she talks about her her focus on uh, election reform and making sure that, uh, in her mind, that uh, everybody has the opportunity to vote. So, I I I, I think I, I in fact I'm I'm just go ahead go ahead and predict it. I think she's not going to run. Okay. Buzz coming in with a hot take. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I don't know. Maybe she it, wants something else, but it, I, I don't see her going away anytime soon. It defies logic to say that she's not going to run, Buzz. It, uh, it does, and, but uh, the the rumor here, mill. Here's, here's the thing: if she runs and loses, then all of the cash cow that this this enormous fundraising operation that she has generated goes away. I think it could potentially be damaged, but she could also spin it again. She lost in 2018 and, and she could say, this is the, you know, the, the, the plan from the evil Republicans worked and they screwed me again. Uh, it can, you know, we need to continue to fight and get people like Lucy McBath going to Congress and yeah, some I, of these other statewide offices elected. Yeah. Pass HR one. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I mean, so I don't know. I, I I'm right now. I, I would uh, if I was if I was placing a bet, I would place a bet on her running. Yeah, um, I would too. But I would I will say that uh, there are, for someone as high profile as her, there are certainly opportunities that may present themselves that would pay a lot more than yeah. than serving as governor. So uh, before we before we take off uh, for the uh, for the week. Uh, yesterday, pretty pretty moving day or emotional day for a lot of people around the country, particularly people who have been following uh, all the the protests that had happened last year in the wake of George Floyd's death. Uh, and so yesterday, uh, a jury in Minneapolis convicted uh, Derek Chauvin on three counts. Um, uh, to, I think all three of them were manslaughter related charges or uh, second, I think second and third degree murder. I think those were the charges in one manslaughter. Um and found him guilty and sent he will be sentenced the my understanding is the sentence ranges from 12 to 40 years mm -hmm. uh so not quite uh not quite life uh but still to some degree justice is being served they certainly won't bring back george floyd uh to his family and his community um a lot of reactions that we we've seen over the course of the last 24 hours as it relates to the conviction yesterday uh some of those have been uh uh, uplifting. Some of those have been uh, not so uplifting. And you've seen some Republicans, certainly like our friend Marjorie Taylor Greene, who deflect and want to talk about Maxine Waters. Uh, and certainly Maxine Waters' comments, as well as some comments made by the President of the United States, could be used uh, on appeal. as Because uh, there's an argument to be made, and I'm not making this argument, but there is an argument to be made by some that he might not have gotten a fair trial. Um, well, and the trial so, judge even noted that he right. thought, he, as he denied the motion for mistrial, he said this could very well open up Maxine Waters' comments, rather, Congresswoman Waters, you know, could open up, uh, open the door on, on appeal. So, Yeah, because there's a, there's a voter, there's uh, not a voter, there's a jury intimidation aspect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we don't convict this guy, are, are there going to be confrontations, to use yeah. Maxine Waters' word? That's right. Uh, you know, look, here's the thing, right? Uh, let's just keep it. Let's, let's, let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. Okay. A man died while having a police officer's knee on his neck for more than nine minutes. Yeah. And, and that's the main thing. And, and the, the case and all these political aspects, I, I, I don't want to look at this as a political Mm -hmm. issue i want to look at this as an issue of a crime was committed and there was due process our system worked yeah. our system of justice worked he I got mean, his def he, he he had a chance his defense counsel they represented him and right they, you know and they and look i 
my understanding based on based on what I've seen, they they did their best to represent him. Well, I think that there are probably some things I would have done differently if I was the attorney. Number one was ask for a change of venue. There's no way in heck I would allow my client to mm-hmm. to be in the same city in which or even close to the same city in which uh, he was accused of that crime. But the th- I think that probably the thinking there was given the high pro. I mean, this is one of the most high pro- profile situations we've seen in the last probably yeah. 20 but years. Same here. He, same he, 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 yeah. he may not have gotten you know, they may have looked at it as like, you know, no matter where we go. Yeah. There are going to be things that he's going to appeal and he's going to point to things and he's going to point to that. And every everybody who appeals blames the the attorney team that they were working with when they got convicted. I mean, that's just a universal that happens every single time. Probably I would have preferred to have seen the jury sequestered. But yes, yes. I mean, and there that'll be another issue when he yeah. goes to appeal. I could see this happening. I could see a, a, an angle now where he has a right to a new trial. Mm-hmm. And that might or might not happen, but, but for me, you, this I is think, this. Let me just finish this point. Yeah, I I don't want to look at this through the lens of politics. Yeah, I, nobody I, does. I want to look. Well, that's not true. If you're well, I mean, like none, Shapiro, of, none, of, none of us do. Yeah, I mean, but, if you're, yeah. I mean, some of our pundits on the right are, are out there today talking about the 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 jury didn't do their job and because they're looking at it through a political lens. Right. They're not. And on the left, it, they're saying that this this is not justice. Right. And, and, and let's just let's just stop yeah. for a second. Take a deep breath and focus on what happened and our and how our system was designed to work. And and talk about it from a foundational principle of government. And and was there an injustice done? And was it corrected? Or or was there were we able to try to make amends as best as we could under this flawed human system that is our our justice system and and that's what i want to focus on i don't want to so, i don't want to look at this as a republican i don't want to look at this as a libertarian i don't want to look at this as a democrat i want to look at this as an american citizen who can have faith in their justice system so the one thing i will say and i, I, I want to i would say we got three four maybe five more minutes before i cut the cord here um because dinner is waiting for me guys um <laughs> gotta let the dogs in so the one, no, I mean, they're keeping them outside. They'll stay out the rest of the night. Um, the one thing I'll say, it, it certainly seems like this has just today. Uh, it, there was there were reports that there might be some sort of bipartisan breakthrough on negotiations on a policing bill. Mm-hmm. That th- those negotiations are happening between Tim Scott, who's the only Senate, only Black Republican in the Senate Republican Conference, yeah, and uh karen bass who is the chair i forget which committee she, uh she chairs uh, in the house judiciary subcommittee she chairs i should say um but she's the lead negotiator for the dem democrats on policing uh scott said there were four or five issues they got to work out i imagine one of those is qualified immunity mm-hmm. um as the son of a police officer um this is one of those things that Qualified immunity has no no basis in, in any statute whatsoever. It's purely a creation of the Supreme Court, um, and it actually defies statute. 42 U.S. U.S.C. 1983 makes it very clear that anyone who uh, who feels their liberty has been infringed upon by a state or local state or local official can bring a lawsuit against that state or local official or government. Um, and the Supreme Court in the 60s created this concept of qualified immunity out of thin air. Uh, and has used it to de- deny justice to people from all walks of life. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it doesn't know skin color. It, it's it's used to protect bad actors uh, uh, in uh, in law enforcement. Um, that That's is being said. I, I I think we we have to be. Uh, I don't disagree with with much of what you say there, Jason. But I th- we have to be very careful. It has to be balanced because if 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 law enforcement if if the perception in law enforcement is that they are just out there doing their job and at any moment they could be prosecuted and, and their lives ruined. Uh, I'll, I'll point to uh, Paul Howard, who clearly you know, brought charges against uh, numerous Atlanta police officers in the middle of a hot, hotly contested re-election campaign. That's apples and oranges. Well, there, but, but, there's but criminal the charges and there's civil liability. Yeah, true. But then, um, you know, as a result of that, we, there... Nobody will come out and admit it, but there are a lot of Atlanta police officers who who are not Atlanta police officers anymore because they quit or retired. Uh, there were periods of time, and maybe it's still going on, of the of the so-called blue flu. So I think their emotions are high on all sides of this issue, and we have to 
we have to proceed very carefully, I think. No, there's a, I do want to delineate between the two here. There's the criminal charges and which, which goes through criminal court proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And then there's, then there's civil action and, and qualified immunity relates to civil action. And, and, and we have seen instances where civil action is, is discouraged because of the invention of qualified immunity. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's legislation, the Ending Qualified Immunity Act, that's Ayanna Presley. Last Congress was Justin Amash and Ayanna Presley. This Congress is Ayanna Presley carrying it on her own. No, by, no, there are no Republican co-sponsors in that bill. We had, apart from Justin Amash, we had one last Congress. And then you have a bill like the, the Qualified Immunity Act. Uh, Congressman Jim Banks from Indiana would codify quali- qualified immunity to answer, to respond to the criticism from uh, people who say qualified immunity is a creation of the court and has no statutory basis, uh, which I, I think that bill's relatively tone deaf. I, I would say in qualified immunity, but at the same time, I'm for anything that moves us in a direction where people who have legitimate civil complaints against law enforcement have a venue to bring those complaints forward and have their day in court. That is what yeah. I support. I can see in the future, I don't know that you'd be able to end qualified immunity, but I think you can create thresholds legislatively yeah. to get there and, 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 and to protect people from frivolous lawsuits because we are a litigious society and every traffic stop would be, you know, the, the cop would be looking over their shoulder at whether or not they're going to be served with papers. It, it, and that's, I don't think, I think we can all agree that's not where we want to go. We, that's want, right. we want police to be confident in their abilities to do their job. Um, but there need to be some certain thresholds established where, uh, you, you know, if you're going to bring a suit like that, you're, you're going to have to meet. I think that would be a compromise position that if, would be palatable to more people than just simply ending it. The thing that frustrates me the most is that although the, the police officer who killed George Floyd was convicted yesterday, his family may never be able to bring a civil action because of the existence of qualified immunity. Well, there's there's not going to be anything to go after. Well, I mean, Derek the, Chauvin's not going to have assets to Well, it does Well, no, Scott, well, you're talking about a relatively small percentage of qualified immunity cases. 99.98% of qualified immunity cases what judgment is rendered is not paid by the officer. And that's that's a like a legitimate statistic. That's not me pulling that out of my ass. So that's a legitimate statistic. That's I can show you the study. It's 0.02% of cases where the officer actually pays. So it's usually a municipality, it's the, yeah. the police department, a union. Well, I, I think there would be a case there because it was policy that allowed Derek Chauvin to do what he did, right? I mean, it was they their use of force policy, uh, I believe, explicitly allowed for that it, type of action. It, right? does, it does not matter what the policy stated it only matters is if there is an, according to precedent, if the right has been established and the police officer uh, uh, violated that right. Mm-hmm. So if the right, if the, the you know, if, if, the, if, okay. a viol- if a violation of a right had happened yeah. and it had been, it had, there's court precedent to show it, that's only when a qualified immunity case, or that's only when qualified immunity is not granted. Mm-hmm. I think I guess, there's, I a, that there's right. a, as, as Scott said, there's a path forward here um it's it's it'll be tough because of the political climate we're in but and i one i just one last thing i'd i'd say a lot of these cases that we see well these incidents th- things we see a piece of video and then other evidence comes forward to to that makes you uh think that maybe what we saw in that first video was not what really happened that it seems to me, I, I didn't follow every moment of this trial, but I listened a lot. I listened to a lot of discussion about it. That seemed to not be the case in this, in this particular instance. What we saw in that video was, was uh, what really happened and what, and eventually I think what, um, you know, Scott, you mentioned keeping the main thing, the main thing. I think that's what the jury did. They looked at at the end of the day, you can have this discussion about all these other things. Uh, but at the end of the day, if it were not that he had a that, that Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's necks for nine and a half minutes, he'd be alive. And yeah. I think that's at the end of the day, that's what happened, what the jury decided. Well, on that note, guys, uh, it's great seeing you both as always. Uh, Scott, I will see you on Saturday because I know we're supposed to have lunch. Um, yeah, uh, just real quick uh, for those who joined us on the stream. Thank you for doing that. If you're watching this podcast, 
uh, or listening to it on Apple Podcasts. We are live streaming uh, on Twitch. We'll, that's out there. We'll put that link on the Peach Pundit uh, page. And, and I'm going to give out uh, a, a special shout out to somebody who participated in our chat, Cannon Fodder. Uh, many comments tonight, and thank you for the feedback. You are the commenter of the podcast, sir. <laughs> and you win because you're the only commenter of the podcast. <laughs> well, we did have one other, but that was a spammer. So we, we oh, that's a, that. I mean, what's well, an infinite growth from zero to one is is an infinite. Uh, if we growth, can keep so this up, a, you know, astounding. Yeah, if we can keep that up, uh, we're going to be something special. Boys. If we can, if we can keep that up, we will have dozens of commenters. <laughs> yes, dozens yeah. of commenters. Oh, the day uh, we will have when we have dozens of commenters. But you, <laughs> but the point being, go go find us on Twitch and uh, follow us so you get notifications. You can join us live. I, I want to see what Cannon Fodder is saying, so I just joined the the, the chat and and just realized that. I can I can now hear myself because we're delayed a little bit. Um, so uh, if you if you enjoyed it, uh, please download, like, subscribe. Uh, obviously, Google uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, debating putting us on on Google Podcasts, but uh, we, I need to know if there is any demand for that before I go and spend my time doing it. Uh, otherwise, please go check out peachfunded.com. And I hope everyone has a good rest of the week, a great weekend, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Peace out. Later, guys.